top of your head hidden or deleted tweets from other world leaders. I would appreciate that, uh, that list. I think it's important that we all hear that. So that brings my next question uh, to the front. Uh, does Twitter maintain a formal list of certain accounts that you actively monitor for misinformation? No, and we don't have a policy against misinformation. We have a policy against misinformation in three categories, which are manipulated media, uh, public health, specifically COVID, and civic integrity, election, in election interference, and voter suppression. That is all we have policy on for misleading information. Uh, we do not have policy or enforcement for any other types of misleading information that you're mentioning. So somebody denying the murder of millions of people uh, or instigating violence against a country as a head of state is not uh, categorically falling in any of those three misinformation or other categories Twitter has? Not misinformation, but we do have other policies around incitement to violence, uh, which, which may, um, some, some of the tweets that you mentioned or the examples that you're mentioning uh, may fall afoul of. Um, but for misleading information, uh, we're focused on those three categories only. So somebody denies the Holocaust has happened is not misinformation? It's, it's misleading information, but we don't have a policy against that type of misleading information. We, Millions of people died, and that's not a violation of Twitter. It's, it's, again, I just don't understand how you can label a president of the United States. Have you ever taken a tweet down from the Ayatollah? Uh, I, I believe we have, but we can get back to you on it. We've certainly labeled tweets, um, and I believe we have taken one down as well. Um, you know, if you if you you said you do not have a list, is that correct? You do not maintain a list. We don't maintain a list of accounts we watch. Uh, we look for reports uh, and issues brought to us, and then we weigh it against our policy and enforce if needed. You look for reports uh, from your employees or from the no from the people news? from the people using the service. Right, and then they they turn that over to your your board of review. Is that correct? The, we, we, well, so in some cases, algorithms take action. Uh, in other cases, achievements do. In some cases, it's a pairing of the two. Mm -hmm. uh, there are numerous examples of blue check marks, uh, blue check marks that are spreading false information that aren't flagged. So uh, <clears throat> Twitter must have some kind of list of priority accounts that it maintains. You have the, the blue check mark list. How do, you decide, how do you decide when to flag a tweet? You got into that a little bit. Is there a formal threshold of retweets or likes that must be met before a tweet is flagged? No. Um, Twitter can't claim that. Uh, I, I just, with your answers on the Itola and others, I, I just don't understand how Twitter can claim to want a world of less hate and misinformation while you simultaneously let the kind of content that the Ayatollah has uh, tweeted out flourish on the platform, including from uh, other world leaders. I, I, I just, it's no wonder that Americans are concerned about politically motivated content moderation at Twitter, given what we have just said. I don't like the idea of a group of unelected elites in San Francisco or Silicon Valley deciding whether my speech is permissible on their platforms. But I like the uh, even less the idea of unelected Washington, D.C. bureaucrats trying to uh, enforce some kind of politically neutral content moderation. Uh, so just as we have heard from other panelists, uh, as we've, we're going to hear throughout the day, we have to be very careful uh, and not rush to legislate in ways that stifle speech. Uh, you can delete Facebook, turn off Twitter, or try to ditch Google, but you cannot unsubscribe from government censors. Uh, Congress should be focused on encouraging speech, not restricting it. Uh, the Supreme Court has tried teaching us that lesson time and time again, and the Constitution demands that we remember it. I'm running short on time, so I'm going to very quickly uh, go through another question. Uh, one of the core ideas of Section 230's liability protections is this. You shouldn't be responsible for what someone else says on your platform. Conversely, you should be liable for what you say or do on your own platform. I think that's pretty common sense. Uh, but courts have not always agreed with this, rep uh, this approach. Even uh, Rep. Chris Cox opined in a recent Wall Street Journal uh, op-ed that Section 230 has sometimes been interpreted by courts more broadly than I expected. For example, allowing some websites to escape liability for content they helped create. Mr. Zuckerberg, uh, I have a simple question for you and each of the panelists today uh, quickly. Uh, I'm, to be clear, I'm not talking about technical tools or operating the platform itself here. Uh, I'm purely talking about content. Do you agree that Internet platforms should be held liable for the specific content that you yourself create on your own platforms? Yes or no? Very quickly. Uh, Senator, I think that that is reasonable. Uh, yes or no, Mr. Dorsey, if Twitter creates specific content, should Twitter be liable for that content? 
Teresa Lebeau as well. Mr. Pichet, same question to you. Yes or no, should Google be liable for the specific content that it creates? Uh, if we are acting as a publisher, I would, I, I would uh, say yes. Yeah. The specific content that you create on your own platform. Yes. That, that seems reasonable. Uh, thank you. I think uh, one of the other sides of liability questions in regard to the good faith removal pr provision uh, in Section 230 uh, that we'll get into a little bit more in the private questions. I know I'm out of time. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you for uh, giving me this time. Uh, Senator Thune, thank you as well. And thanks to the witnesses. Thank you, Senator Gardner. Um, the ranking member has now deferred to Senator Klobuchar. So, um, uh, Senator, you are now recognized. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I want to note first that this hearing comes six days before Election Day, and uh, it makes, I, I believe, we're politicizing, and the Republican majority is politicizing, uh, which should actually not be a partisan topic. And I do want to thank uh, the uh, witnesses here for appearing, but also uh, for the work that they're doing to try to encourage voting and to put out uh, the correct information when uh, the president and others are undermining vote by mail, something we're doing in every state in the country right now. Second point, uh, Republicans failed to pass my bipartisan Honest Ads Act, uh, and the White House blatantly blocked the bipartisan election security bill that I had with Senator Langford, as well as several other Republicans. And it's one of the reasons I think we need a new president. Uh, third, uh, my Republican colleagues in the Senate, many of them I work with very well on this committee, uh, but we have had four years uh, to do something uh, when it comes to uh, antitrust, privacy, uh, local news, a subject that briefly came up, and so many other things. So I'm going to use my time to focus on what I consider, in Justice Ginsburg's words, to be a blueprint for the future. I'll start with you, Mr. Zuckerberg. How many people log into Facebook every day? Senator, it is uh, more than two billion. Okay. And how much money have you made on political advertisements in the last two years? Uh, Senator, I do not know off the top of my head. It is a relatively small part of our revenue. Okay. Small for you, but I think it's 2.2 .2 billion. Um, over 10,000 ads sold since May 2018. Those are your numbers and we can check them uh, later. Do you require Facebook employees to review the content of each of the political ads that you sell uh, in order to ensure that they comply with the law and your own internal rules? Uh, Senator, we require all political advertisers to be verified before they could run ads. Um, and I, I believe we do review uh, advertising as, as well. But does a real person actually read the political ads that you sell, yes or no? Uh, S Senator, I, I imagine that a person does not look at every single ad. Our systems are a combination of artificial intelligence systems and people. We have 35,000 people who do content and security review for us, but Okay. The massive amount I, don't, of I, I really just had a straightforward question because I don't think they do. I think the algorithms hit in because I think the ads instantly are placed. Is that correct? Senator, my understanding of the, the way the system works is we have computers and artificial intelligence um, scan everything. And, and if we think that there are potential violations, then either the AI system will act or it will flag it to uh, the tens of thousands of people who do content review but I just, with all the money you have you could have a real person review like a lot of the other uh, traditional media organizations do so another question uh when john mccain and i and senator warner introduced the honest ads act we got pushback from your company others and you're initially against it then we discuss this at a hearing you're for it i appreciate that um and have you spent any of the money? I know you spent the most money. Facebook spent the most money ever lobbying last year. Have you spent any of the money trying to change or block the bill? Senator, no. Years? It, it, in fact, I've endorsed it publicly and we've implemented it into our systems, okay. even though it hasn't become law. I, um, I'm, a, I'm a big supporter. Have you supporter done anything in the past that. to try to change it? No. Have you done anything to get it passed? Because we're, we're at a roadblock on it. And I do appreciate that you voluntarily implemented some of it, but 
have you voluntarily implemented the part of the Honest Ads Act where you fully disclose which groups of people are being targeted by political ads? Senator, we have, I think, industry leading transparency around political ads, and part of that is showing um, which audiences, um, in broad terms, uh, ended up seeing the ads. Um, you know, of course, getting the right resolution on that is, is challenging without it becoming a privacy issue. But we've we've tried to do that and provide as much transparency as we can. And I, I think we're we're currently leading in that area. Um, and to your question about how I, we're, I still have concerns, and I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I have such limited time. Uh, one of the things that I um, last thing I want to ask you about is device, divisiveness on the platform. Um, and I you, I know there's been a recent uh, studies have shown uh, that. Part of your algorithms, they push people towards more polarized content, left, right, whatever. Um, in fact, one of your researchers warned senior executives that our algorithms exploit the human brain's attraction to divisiveness. The way I look at it, more divisiveness, more time on the platform, more time on the platform, the company makes more money. Uh, does that bother you, what it's done to our politics? Uh, Senator, I. I respectfully disagree with that characterization of how the systems work. We design our systems to show people the content that's going to be the most meaningful to them, um, which is, is not trying to be as divisive as possible. Most of the content on the systems is not political. Um, it's things like making sure that you can see when you're you know, your cousin had her baby or. OK, OK, I'm going to I'm going to move on to um, to Google here and Mr. Pache, but I'm Mr. Pichai, but I'm telling you right now that that's not what I'm talking about. The cousins and the babies here. I'm talking about conspiracy theories and all the things that I think us, the uh, senators on both sides of the aisle know what I'm talking about. And I think it's been corrosive. Uh, Google, uh, Mr. Pichai. Um, I have not really liked your response to the lawsuit and what's been happening. I think we need a change in competition policy for this country. I hope I'll be able to ask you more about it at the Judiciary uh, Committee. And I think your response isn't just offensive, it's been defiant to the Justice Department and suits all over the world. You control almost 90% of all general search engine queries, 70% of the search advertising market. Don't you see these practices as anti-competitive? Uh, Senator, uh, we are a popular general purpose search engine. We do see robust competition in many categories of information. And uh, you know, we, in, we invest significantly in R&D. We are innovating. We are lowering prices in all the markets we are operating in. Happy to uh, you know, uh, engage and discuss it further. Well, one of your employees testified before the antitrust subcommittee last month, and he suggested that Google wasn't dominant in ad tech, that it was only one of many companies in a highly competitive ad tech landscape. Yet Google has 90% of the publisher ad server market, a product of its double click acquisition. Does the market sound highly competitive to you when you have 90% of it? Very brief answer. Many publishers can use simultaneously many tools. Amazon and Trade Desk alone have grown significantly in the last two years. Uh, you know, we this, this is a market in which we share majority of our revenue. Our margins are low. We are happy to take feedback here. We are trying to support the publishing industry, but you know, definitely open to feedback and happy to engage in discussion. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Well, I think you've gotten you, feedback from the boss, so uh, well, I'm looking forward to our next hearing to discuss it more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Thune. You're now recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, and I appreciate you convening the hearing today, which is an important follow-up to the subcommittee hearing that we convened in July on Section 230. Many of us here today and many of those we represent are deeply concerned about the possibility of political bias and discrimination by large internet and social media platforms. Others are concerned that even if your actions aren't skewed, that they are hugely consequential for our public debate, yet you operate with limited accountability. Such distrust is intensified by the fact that the moderation practices used to suppress or amplify content remain largely a black box to the public. Moreover, the public explanations given by the platforms for taking down or suppressing content too often seem like excuses that have to be walked back after scrutiny. And due to exceptional secrecy with which platforms protect their algorithms and content moderation practices, it's been impossible to prove one way or another whether political bias exists. So users are stuck with anecdotal information that frequently seems
to confirm their worst fears, which is why I've introduced two bipartisan bills, the Platform Accountability and Consumer Transparency, or the PACT Act, and the Filter Bubble Transparency Act to give users, the regulators, and the general public meaningful insight into online content moderation decisions and how algorithms may be amplifying or suppressing information. And so I look forward to continuing that discussion today. Um, my Democrat colleagues suggest that when we criticize um, the uh, bias against conservatives, somehow working the refs, but the analogy of working the refs assumes that it's legitimate even to think of, of you as refs. Uh, it assumes that uh, you three Silicon Valley CEOs get to decide what political speech gets amplified or suppressed, and it assumes that you're the arbiters of truth, or at the very least, the publishers making editorial decisions about speech. So yes or no, um, I would ask this of each of the three of you, are the Democrats correct that you all are the legitimate referees over our political speech? Mr. Zuckerberg, are you the ref? Uh, Senator, Senator, I certainly uh, think not, and I do not want us to, to have that role. Mr. Dorsey, are you the ref? No. Mr. Pashai, are you the ref? Uh, Senator, I do think we make content moderation decisions, uh, but we are transparent about it, and we do it to protect users, but we really believe and support maximizing freedom of expression. I'll take that as, as three no's, and, and I agree with that. You are not the referees of our political speech. That's why all three of you have to be more transparent and fair with your content moderation policies and your content selection algorithms, because at the moment, it is, as I said, largely a black box. There is real mistrust among the American people about whether you're being fair or transparent. And this extends to concerns about the kinds of amplification and suppression decisions your platforms may make on election day and during the post-election period if the results of the election are too close to call. And so I just want to underscore again for my Democratic friends who keep using this really bad referee analogy, Google, Facebook, and Twitter are not the referees over our democracy. Now, second question, uh, the PACT Act, which I referenced earlier, includes provisions to give users due process and an explanation when content they post is removed. So this is, again, a yes or no question. Do you agree that users should be entitled to due process and an explanation when content they post has been taken down? Mr. Zuckerberg. Senator, I think that that would be a good principle to have. Thank you. Mr. Dorsey. Absolutely. We, we believe in a fair and straightforward appeals process. Great. Mr. Bashai? Uh, yes, Senator. Terrific. Thank you. Um, Mr. Zuckerberg, Mr. Dorsey, the, your platforms knowingly suppressed or limited the visibility of this New York Post article about the content on Hunter Biden's uh, abandoned laptop. Many in the country are justifiably concerned how often the suppression of major newspaper articles occurs online. Uh, and I would say, uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, would you commit to provide for the record a complete list of newspaper articles that Facebook suppressed or limited the distribution of over the past five years, along with an explanation of why each article was suppressed or the distribution was limited? Uh, Senator, I can certainly follow up with, with you and your team to, to discuss that. Um, this was, uh, we, we have an independent fact-checking program, as you're, as you're saying. Um, you know, we try not to be arbiters of, of what is true ourselves, uh, but we have partnered with fact-checkers uh, around the world to help um, assess that, to prevent uh, misinformation and, and viral hoaxes from becoming widely distributed on our platform. And I believe that uh, the information that they fact check and the content that they fact check is public. So I think that there, there's probably already a record of this that can be reviewed. Yeah, it, it, but if you could do that as it applies to newspapers, that would be very helpful. And Mr. Dorsey, would you commit to doing the same on behalf of Twitter? Uh, we would absolutely be open to it. And we, you know, we are suggesting going a step further, um, which is aligned with what you're introducing in the PACT Act, which is much more transparency around our process, the content moderation process, uh, and also the results, the outcomes. 
um, and doing that on a regular basis. I, I do agree and think that builds more accountability and ultimately that, that lends itself to more trust. Okay, great, thank you. All right, very quickly, I don't have a lot of time either, but I often hear from conservative and, and religious Americans who, who look at the public statements of your companies, the uh, geographic uh, concentration of your companies, and the political donations of your employees, which often are in the 80 to 90 percent to Democrat politicians. And uh, you can see why this lack of ideological diversity among the executives and employees of your company could be problematic and may be contributing to some of the distrust among conservatives and Republican users. And so I guess the question that I would ask is, and, and Mr. Zuckerberg, uh, my understanding is that the person that's in charge of election integrity and security at Facebook is a former uh, Joe Biden staffer. Um, is there someone that's closely associated with President Trump who's in the same sort of election integrity role at Facebook? And uh, what, how do you all respond to that argument that there isn't sufficient balance um, in terms of the, the political ideology or diversity in, in your companies? And uh, how do you deal with the, the lack of sort of trust that creates among conservatives? Let's see if we can have uh, three brief answers there. Um, Senator, I think having balance is, is valuable, and we, we try to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of the example that you say of, of someone in charge of the, the, this process who worked for, um, for, for Biden in the past, so we can follow up on, on that if that's, if that's follow, right. Follow up on the record uh, for the rest of this answer, please, Mr. Zuckerberg. Thank you. All right. Mr. Dorsey. Well, this is why I do believe it's important to have more transparency around our, 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 our process and our practices. Um, and it's independent of the viewpoints that our employees hold. Mr. We need Cox. to make sure that we're showing people that we have objective policies and enforcement. And Mr. Pekai. Um, in these teams, uh, there are people who are uh, liberal, Republican, libertarian, and so on. Uh, we are committed. We consult widely with uh, important third-party organizations across both sites when we develop our policies. And, you know, as a CEO, I'm committed to running it uh, without any political bias, but happy to engage more on answer. Nancy. Thank you, gentlemen, and thank you, Senator Thune. Uh, the ranking member has now deferred to Senator Blumenthal. Sir, you are recognized. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you to the ranking member. I want to begin by associating myself with the very thoughtful comments made by the ranking member as to the need for broader consideration of issues of privacy and competition and local news. They are vitally important. And also with the comments made by my colleagues, Senator Klobuchar, about the need for antitrust review, and I assume we'll be examining some of these topics in November before the Judiciary Committee. Uh, you know, I've been an advocate of reform of Section 230 for literally 15 years. When I was Attorney General of the State of Connecticut, I uh, raised this issue of the absolute immunity that no longer seems appropriate. So I really welcome the bipartisan consensus that we're seeing now that there needs to be uh, constructive review. But uh, frankly, I am appalled that my Republican colleagues are holding this hearing literally days before an election when they seem to want to bully and browbeat the platforms here to try to tilt them uh, toward President Trump favor. Uh, the, the timing seems inexplicable except to name the ref in effect. Uh, I recognize the referee analogy is not completely exact, but that's exactly what they're trying to do, namely to bully and browbeat these platforms to favor Senator uh, uh, President Trump's tweets and posts. Uh, and frankly, Senate, uh, 
President Trump has broken all the norms and uh, he has put on your platforms potentially dangerous and lethal misinformation and disinformation. I'm going to hold up one of them. Uh, this one, as you can see, pertains to COVID. Uh, we have learned to live with it, he says, just like we are learning to live with COVID, talking about the flu, we have learned to live with it. In most populations, far less lethal. Uh, he has said that uh, children, I would say almost definitely, but almost immune from this disease. Uh, he has said about the elections, big problems and discrepancies with mail-in ballots all over the USA must have final total on November 3rd. Fortunately, the platforms are acting to label or take down these kinds of posts, but my Republican colleagues have been silent. They've lost their phones or their voices, and the platforms, in my view, have you know, we're, we're, We just lost your voice there in, in mid-sentence, Richard. Um, let's suspend for just a minute till we get, uh, I hope you can hear me now. There, there we are. Okay. That we, we can hear you now, Senator Blumenthal. Uh, just, just a, a, a start back one sentence before we, we had you until then. Uh, I just want to say about this, this information from the president, there's been deafening silence from my Republican colleague. And now we have hearing that is in effect designed to intimidate, bully, browbeat the platforms that have labeled this in disinformation for exactly what it is. Uh, we're on the verge of a massive onslaught on the integrity of our elections. President Trump has indicated that he will potentially interfere by posting disinformation on election day or the morning after. The Russians have begun already interfering in our elections. We've all received briefings that are literally chilling about what they are doing. And the FBI and the CSIS have recently issued public alerts that, quote, foreign actors and cyber criminals likely to spread disinformation regarding 2020 results. They are making 2016 look like child's play in what they are doing. So President Trump and the Republicans have a plan which involves disinformation and misinformation. The Russians have a plan. I want to know whether uh, you have a plan, Facebook, Twitter, Google, a plan, if the president uses your platforms to say on the day of the election that there is rigging or fraud without any basis in evidence, or attempts to say that the election is over and the voting, the counting of votes must stop either on November 4th or some day subsequent. And I would like, uh, as to this question about whether you have a plan, uh, a yes or no. Uh, Senator, Senator I'm sorry. Um, we, we do, we have policies, uh, related to all of the areas that you just mentioned, um, candidates or, or, or campaigns trying to delegitimize uh, methods of voting or the election, candidates trying to prematurely declare victory, um, and candidates trying to spread voter suppression material um, that is misleading about how, when, um, or, or where to vote. Uh, so we're, we're, we've taken a number of steps on that front. Perhaps we could take Mr. Okay. McKay next and then Mr. Dorsey. 
Mr. Pakai. Uh, Senator, yes, uh, we definitely are uh, robustly. We've been planning for a while, and uh, we we rely on raising up uh, new sources through moments like that, uh, as well as we have closely partnered with the Associated Press to make sure we can provide users the most accurate information possible. And yes, we also we also have a plan. Um, so you know, our plan and our enforcement around these issues is pointing to more information and specifically state election officials. Um, so we want to give uh, the people using the service as much information as possible. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal. Senator Cruz. Chairman, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. The three witnesses we have before this committee today collectively pose, I believe, the single greatest threat to free speech in America and the greatest threat we have to free and fair elections. Yesterday, I spent a considerable amount of time speaking with both Mr. Zuckerberg and Mr. Pichai. I have concerns about the behavior of both of their companies. I would note that Facebook is at the minimum at least trying to make some efforts in the direction of defending free speech. I appreciate their doing so. Google, I agree with the concerns that Senator Klobuchar raised. I think Google has more power than any company on the face of the planet. And the antitrust concerns are real. The impact of Google is profound. And I expect we will have continued and ongoing discussions about Google's abuse of that power and its willingness to manipulate search outcomes to influence and change election results. But today, I want to focus my questioning on Mr. Dorsey and on Twitter. Because of the three players before us, I think Twitter's conduct has by far been the most egregious. Mr. Dorsey, does Twitter have the ability to influence elections? No. You don't believe Twitter has any ability to influence elections? No, we are one part of a broad spectrum of communication channels that people have. So you're testifying to this committee right now that, that, that Twitter, when it silences people, when it censors people, when it blocks political speech, that has no impact on elections? People, people have choice of other communication channels with which- not if, not if they don't hear information. If you don't think you have the power to influence elections, why do you block anything? Uh, well, we have policies that are focused on making sure that more voices on the platform are possible. We see a lot of abuse and harassment, which ends up silencing people and having them leave from the platform. All right, Mr. Dorsey, I find your opening questions, your opening answers absurd on their face. But let's talk about the last two weeks in particular. As you know, I have long been concerned about Twitter's pattern of censoring and silencing individual Americans with whom Twitter disagrees. But two weeks ago, Twitter and to a lesser extent Facebook crossed a threshold that is fundamental in our country. Two weeks ago, Twitter made the unilateral decision to censor the New York Post in a series of two blockbuster articles, both alleging evidence of corruption against Joe Biden, the first concerning Ukraine, the second concerning communist China. And Twitter made the decision, number one, to prevent users, any user, from sharing those stories. And number two, you went even further and blocked the New York Post from sharing on Twitter its own reporting. Why did Twitter make the decision to censor the New York Post? Uh, we had a hack materials policy. Um, that we when was that policy on. adopted? Uh, in 2018, I believe. In 2018, go ahead. What was, what, what was the policy? So the policy is around um, limiting the spread of materials uh, that are hacked. Um, we didn't want Twitter to be a distributor for hack materials. Um, we found that the New York Post, because it showed the direct materials, screenshots of the direct materials, and it was unclear how those were attained, that it felt that it fell under this policy. Now, we, so in your view, if it's unclear the source of, uh, of a document, and in this instance, the New York Post documented what it said the source was, which it said it was a, uh, a laptop owned by Hunter Biden that had been turned into a re re repair store. So they weren't hiding what they claimed to be the source. 
Is it, is it your position that Twitter, when you can't tell the source, blocks, blocks press stories? No, not at all. Um, we, our, our team made a fast decision. Uh, the enforcement action, however, of blocking URLs, both in tweets and uh, in DM, in direct messages, we believe was incorrect. And we changed it. Today, right now, the New York Post is still blocked from tweeting two weeks later. Yes, they have to log into their account, which they can do at this minute, delete the original tweet, which fell under our original enforcement actions, and they can tweet the exact same material and the exact same article, and it would go through. And so, Mr. Dorsey, your ability is you have the power to force a media out. And let's be clear, the New York Post isn't just some random guy tweeting. The New York Post has the fourth highest circulation of any newspaper in America. The New York Post is over 200 years old. The New York Post was founded by Alexander Hamilton. And your position is that, that you can sit in Silicon Valley and demand of the media that you can tell them what stories they can publish and you can tell the American people what reporting they can hear. Is that right? No, uh, this was, this was a, you know, every person, every account, uh, every uh, organization that signs up to Twitter agrees to a terms of service. A terms of service is So public. media outlets must genuflect and obey your dictates if they wish to be able to communicate with readers. Is that right? No, not at all. We, you know, we, we recognize an error in this policy and specifically the enforcement. You're still blocking their posts. It. You're we still blocking it. their posts. Right now, today, you're blocking their posts. We're not blocking the post. Anyone can tweet. Can the New York Post uh, post on their on a Twitter account? If they go into their account. No is your answer to that. No, no. unless they, they can and, and, and agree with your dictates. Let me ask you something. You, you claimed it was because of a hacked materials uh, policy. I find that facially uh, highly dubious and clearly employed in, in, in a deeply partial way. Did Twitter block the distribution of the New York Times' story a few weeks ago that purported to be based on copies of President Trump's tax returns? We didn't find that a violation of our terms of service and this policy in particular because it was reporting about the material. It wasn't distributing okay. the material. Okay, well, that's actually not true. They, they posted what they purported to be original source materials, and federal law, federal statute makes it a crime, a federal felony, to distribute someone's tax returns against their knowledge. So that material was based on something that was distributed in violation of federal law, and yet Twitter gleefully allowed people to circulate that. But when the article was critical of Joe Biden, Twitter engaged in rampant uh, censorship and silencing. And again, we recognized errors in that policy. We, we changed it within 24 hours. This is, this but is you're still the blocking the New York Post. You haven't changed it. We have changed it. They can log into their account, delete the original tweet. Uh, that was you forced the Politico reporter to take down his post about the New York Post as well. Is that correct? Within that 24-hour period, yes. But we, you know, as the policy has changed, anyone can tweet. So the Twitter post. takes the view. You can censor post. the New York Post. You can censor Politico. Presumably, you can censor the New York Times or any other media outlet. Mr. Dorsey. Who the hell elected you and put you in charge of what the media are allowed to report and what the American people are allowed to hear? And why do you persist in behaving as a democratic super PAC, silencing views to the contrary of your political beliefs? Let, let's give uh, Mr. Dorsey uh, uh, a few seconds to answer that, and th then we'll have to conclude this, this um, segment. Well, we're, we're not doing that. Uh, and this is why I opened um, this hearing with calls for more transparency. We realize we need to earn trust more. We realize that more accountability is needed to show our intentions and to show the outcomes. Thank you, um, Senator. So I, I hear the concerns and acknowledge them, but we want to we fix it with more transparency. Thank you, Senator Cruz. Uh, the ranking member has deferred now to Senator Schatz, who uh, joins us remotely. Sir, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member. You know, this is an unusual hearing at an unusual time. I have never seen a hearing so close to an election on any topic, let alone on something that is so obviously a violation of our obligation under the law and the rules of the Senate to stay out of electioneering. 
we never do this, and there is a very good reason that we don't call people before us to yell at them for not doing our bidding during an election. It is a misuse of taxpayer dollars. What's happening here is a scar on this committee and the United States Senate. What we are seeing today is an attempt to bully the CEOs of private companies into carrying out a hit job on a presidential candidate by making sure that they push out foreign and domestic misinformation meant to influence the election. To our witnesses today, you and other tech leaders need to stand up to this immoral behavior. The truth is that because some of my colleagues accuse you, your companies, and your employees of being biased or liberal, you have institutionally bent over backwards and overcompensated. You've hired Republican operatives, hosted private dinners with Republican leaders, and in contravention of your terms of service, given special dispensation to right-wing voices and even throttled progressive journalism. Simply put, the Republicans have been successful in this play. And so during one of the most consequential elections in American history, my colleagues are trying to run this play again, and it is an embarrassment. I have plenty of questions for the witnesses on Section 230, on antitrust, on privacy, on anti-Semitism, on their relationship with journalism, but we have to call this hearing what it is, it's a sham. And so for the first time in my eight years in the United States Senate, I'm not gonna use my time to ask any questions because this is nonsense, and it's not gonna work this time. This play my colleagues are running did not start today, and it's not just happening here in the Senate. It is a coordinated effort by Republicans across the government. Last May, President Trump ex issued an executive order to narrow the protections of Section 230 to discourage platforms from engaging in content moderation on their own sites. After it was issued, President Trump started tweeting that Section 230 should be repealed as if he understands Section 230. In the last six months, President Trump has tweeted repeal Section 230 five times, in addition to other tweets that, in which he's threatened the tech companies. A few weeks later, President Trump withdrew the nomination of FCC Commissioner Mike O'Reilly. Republican Commissioner O'Reilly questioned the FCC's authority to regulate under Section 230, and the statute is not unclear on this. President Trump then nominated Nathan Simington who was the drafter of NTIA's petition to the FCC regarding Section 230. And Republican senators have enthusiastically participated. Since June of this year, six Republican-only bills have been introduced, all of which threaten platforms' uh, ability to moderate content on their site. And as the election draws closer, this Republican effort has become more and more aggressive. September 23rd, DOJ unveil, unveiled its own Section 230 draft legislation that would narrow the protections under the current law and discourage platforms from moderating content on their own site. September 14th and October 1st, respectively, Senators Hawley and Kennedy tried to pass their Republican-only Section 230 bills via live unanimous consent. Now, what that means is they went down to the floor and without a legislative hearing, without any input from Democrats at all, they tried to pass something so foundational to the internet unanimously without any discussion and any debate. On the same day as Senator Kennedy's UC attempt, Senator Wicker forced the Commerce Committee without any discussion or negotiation beforehand to vote on subpoenaing the CEOs of Twitter, Facebook, and Google to testify. That's why we're here today. Two weeks later on October 14th, Justice Clarence Thomas on his own issued a statement that appeared to support the narrowing of the court's interpretation on Section 230. The very next day, the FCC chairman, Ajit Pai, announced that the FCC would seek to clarify the meaning of Section 230. On that day, Senator Graham announced that the Judiciary Committee would vote to subpoena the tech companies over the content moderation. And the context of this, in addition to everything, is that Senators, Senator Cruz is on Maria Bartiromo, talking about a blockbuster story from the New York Post. Uh, Senator Hawley is on Fox and on the Senate floor. And the Commerce Committee itself is tweeting a, out a campaign-style uh, video 
that sort of alarmingly says Hunter Biden's emails, tech censorship. On October 21st, Senator Hawley reattempted to pass his bill on Section 230 via UC, again without going through any committee markup or vote. And on Friday, Senator Graham announced that the CEOs of Facebook and Twitter would testify before the Senate Judiciary Committee on November 17th. This is bullying, and it is for electoral purposes. Do not let the United States Senate bully you into carrying the water for those who want to advance misinformation. And don't let the specter of removing Section 230 protections or uh, an amendment that anti or any other kinds of threats cause you to be a party to the subversion of our democracy. I will be glad to participate in good faith bipartisan hearings on these issues when the election is over. But this is not that. Thank you. Thank you, um, Senator Schatz. Next is Senator Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, I'm not here to bully you today, and I am certainly not here to read any kind of political statement uh, right before an election. To me, this hearing is not a sham. I am here to gain some clarity uh, on the policies that, that you use. I am here to uh, uh, look at your proposals for more transparency because your platforms have become an integral part of our democratic process for both candidates, but also more importantly for our citizens as well. Your platforms also have enormous power to manipulate user behavior and to direct contact, content and to shape narratives. Uh, Mr. Dorsey, I, um, I heard your opening statement, I've read it. Uh, you also tweeted that the concept of good faith is what's being challenged by many of you here today. Some of you don't trust we're acting in good faith. That's the problem I want to focus on solving. So Mr. Dorsey, uh, why should we trust you with so much power? In other words, why shouldn't we regulate you more? Well, I, 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 the suggestions we're making around around more transparency um, is how we want to build that trust. Uh, we we do agree that we should be publishing more of our practice of content moderation. We've made decisions to moderate content. We've made decisions to moderate content to make sure that we are enabling as many voices on our platform as possible. And I acknowledge and completely agree with the concerns that it feels like uh, a black box and anything that we can do to bring transparency to it, including publishing uh, our policies, our practices, answering very simple questions around how content is moderated, and then doing what we can uh, around um, the, the growing trend of algorithms moderating more of this content. Um, as I said, this one is a tough one to actually bring transparency to. Uh, explainability in AI is is a field of research, but it is far out. And I think a better um, opportunity is giving people more choice around the algorithms they use, uh, including people who turn off the algorithms completely, which is what we're attempting to do. So, right, but I, you you can understand uh, the concerns that that people have uh, when when they see that um, what many consider you're making value judgments on what's going to be on your platforms. Um, you say users can uh, report uh, content and then, and then you take action. But certainly you can understand um, that, that people are very um, concerned. They're very worried about what they see as um, manipula manipulation on your part. And to say you're going to have more transparency and um, yeah, that's, sir, I would say with respect, I don't, I don't think that's enough just to say you're, you're going to have that transparency there and, and uh, you're not uh, influencing people because as any time um, a free press is um, blocked um, on both sides, uh, what, what we would view in the political world as both sides here, 
uh, when views aren't able to be expressed, um, that does have a, a huge amount of influence. I, I completely understand and I, I agree that it's not enough. I don't think transparency alone uh, addresses these concerns. I, I think we have to continue to push for a more straightforward and fast and efficient appeals process. And I do believe we need to look deeply at algorithms and how they're used and how people have choice on how to use those algorithms or whether they use them. But ultimately somebody makes a decision. Where does the buck stop with the algorithms? You know, where does the buck stop? Who's going to make a value judgment? Because in my opinion, it is a value judgment. Well, ultimately I'm accountable to all the decisions that the company makes, but we want to make sure that we're providing clear frameworks that are objective and that can be tested and that we have multiple checkpoints associated with them so that we can learn quickly if we're doing something in error. And when, when your company um, amplifies some content over others, is it fair for you to have legal protections for your actions? Uh, we believe so. Keep in mind, a lot of our algorithms recommending content uh, is, is focused on saving people time. So we're ranking things that people, we, the, the algorithms believe people would find most relevant, most valuable in the time. But it's your value judgment on what those people would find most relevant. No, it's not a value judgment. It's based on engagement metrics. It's based on who you follow. It's based on activity you take on on the network. Mr. Zuckerberg, with your ever expanding content uh, moderation policies, are you materially involved in that content? Uh, Senator, yes, I, I uh, spend a, a meaningful amount of time on making sure that we get our content policies and enforcement right. Okay, thank you. Um, what, if any, changes do you think should be made to Section 230 to address the specific concerns regarding content moderation uh, that you've heard so far this morning? Uh, Senator, I would outline a couple. First, I agree with Jack that uh, increasing transparency into the content moderation process uh, would be an important step for building trust and accountability. One thing that we already do at Facebook is every quarter uh, we issue a transparency report where for each of the 20 or so categories of harmful content that we uh, are trying to address, so terrorism, child exploitation, um, incitement of violence, um, pornography, di different types of content, um, we issue a report on how we're doing, um, what the prevalence of that content is on our network, um, and what percent of it our systems are able to take down before someone even has to report it to us. And what the precision is and, the, the, and, 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 and basically how accurate our systems are at dealing with it. And getting to the point where um, you know, everyone across the industry is reporting on, on a baseline uh, like that, I think would be valuable for people to uh, have these discussions, not just about anecdotes of, okay, I saw a piece of content and I, I'm not necessarily sure I agree with how that was moderated. It would allow the conversation to move to data um, so that we, we can understand uh, how these platforms are performing overall and hold them accountable. Thank at you. Is, at issue with your answer, I think, would be the, the time involved, that it wouldn't be a, an immediate response to have that conversation, as, as you call it. Um, I hope that all three of you gentlemen can uh, answer that question in, in written questions. So Thank my you. time is up. Thank you, Thank Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Chair. Fisher. I appreciate that. We are to, uh, to take now Senator Cantwell's uh, questioning after which we are going to accommodate our witnesses with a five minute recess. So Senator Cantwell, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Can. And can you see me this time? We can now see you. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, this is such an important hearing. I agree with many of the statements my colleagues have had that this hearing didn't need to take place at this moment, that the important discussion about how we keep a thriving internet economy and how we continue to make sure that hate speech and misinformation is taken down from the web is something that would probably better been done in January than now. But here we are today and we've heard some astounding things that I definitely must refute. 
First of all, I'm not going to take lightly anybody who tries to undermine mail-in voting. Mail-in voting in the United States of America is safe. The state of Washington, the state of Oregon have been doing it for years. There is nothing wrong with our mail-in system. So I think that there'll be secretaries of state, there'll be our law enforcement agencies who've worked hard with state election officials and others who will be talking about how this process works and how we're going to fight to protect it. I'm also going to not demean an organization just because they happen to be headquartered in the state of Washington or to have business there. That somebody claims that just because the geography of a company somehow makes it uber political for one side of the aisle or another, I seriously doubt. I know that because I see many of you coming to the state of Washington for Republican fundraisers with these officials. I know you know darn well that there are plenty of Republicans that work in high tech firms. So the notion that somehow these people are, are crossing the aisle because of something and creating censorship the notion that free speech is about the ability to say things and it doesn't take well maybe we need to have a history lesson from high school again but yes free speech means that people can make outrageous statements about their beliefs so i think that the ceos are telling us here what their process is for taking down healthcare information that's in fact that's not true that is a threat to the public and information that is a threat to our democracy. That is what they're talking about. So I want to make it clear that this hearing could have happened at a later date, and I don't appreciate the misinformation that is coming across today that is trying to undermine our election process. It is safe. It is the backbone of what distinguishes America from other countries in the world. We do know how to have a safe and fair election. And one of the ways that we're doing that is to have these individuals work with our law enforcement entities. My colleague, Gary Peters, made it very clear. They successfully helped stop a threat on the governor of Michigan. And why? Because they were working with them to make sure that information was passed on. So this is what we're talking about. We're talking about whether we're going to be on the side of freedom and information and whether we're going to put our shoulder to the wheel to continue to make sure that engine is there or whether we're gonna prematurely try to get rid of 230 and squash free speech. And so I wanna make sure that we continue to move forward. So Mr. Zuckerberg, I'd like to turn to you because there was a time where there was great concern about what happened in Myanmar, about the government using information against a Muslim minority, and you took action and reformed the system. And just recently in September, uh, Facebook and Twitter announced they had suspended networks accounts linked to various organizations and for use of techniques laundering Russian-backed websites accounts and derisive propaganda that we associated with state-run attempts to interfere in our elections. So could you please, Mr. Zuckerberg, talk about what you are doing to make sure state-run entities don't interfere in U.S. elections? Yes, thank you, Senator. Uh, since 2016, um, we've been building up uh, some very sophisticated systems uh, to make sure that we can stop foreign interference in elections, not just in the U.S., but all around the world. And a lot of this involves building up AI systems to identify when clusters of accounts aren't behaving in the way that a normal person would. They're behaving as fake accounts in some coordinated way. Um, a lot of this is also about um, forming partnerships. The, the tech companies here today um, work more closely together to share signals um, about what's happening on the different platforms to be able to combat these threats, um, as well as working more closely with law enforcement and intelligence communities around the world. And the net result of that is that over the last few years, um, we've taken down uh, more than 100 networks that uh, we're potentially attempting to um, to spread misinformation or interfere. Um, a lot of them were coming from Russia or Iran, um, a growing number from China as well. Um, and at this point, I'm I'm proud that um, you know our company and and um, as well as the others in the industry, I think, have built systems that are are very effective at this. It's we we can't stop uh, countries like Russia. Uh, from trying to interfere in, in an election. Only the U.S. government um, can, can um, really push back and with the appropriate leverage to do that. 
but we have built up systems uh, to make sure that we can we can identify much faster when they're attempting to do that. Um, and I think that that should give the American people um, a good amount of confidence leading into this election. And is it true that those entities are trying to find domestic sources to help with that misinformation? Senator, yes, the, the tactics of these different governments um, are certainly evolving, um, including trying to find people outside of, of their country. And in, in some cases, uh, we're seeing domestic interference operations um, as well. And the systems have had to evolve to be able to identify and take those down as well. Um, of the hundred or so uh, networks that I just cited that we took down, um, about half were, were domestic operations at this point. And that's in, in various countries around the world, not primarily in the U.S. Um, but, but this is, is a, a global phenomenon that we need to make sure that we uh, continue pushing forward aggressively on. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Pachai, I'd like to turn to you for a second because I do want information from Facebook on this point too, but I'd like to turn to you. There's information now from uh, media organizations that it may be as much as 30 to 50 percent of Google ad revenue of the, that broadcasters and newsprint are losing somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of their revenue that they could be getting to newspapers and broadcasting, losing it to the formats that Google has as it relates to their platform and ad information. Can you confirm what information you have about this? And do you think that Google is taking ad revenue from these news sources in an unfair way? Uh, Senator, uh, it's an important topic. Uh, it's a complex topic. I do think journalism, as you rightfully have called attention to it, particularly local journalism, is very important. The internet has been a tremendously disrupting force, and the pandemic has uh, exacerbated it. I'm happy today, as Google, uh, you know, I would make the case that we believe in raising news across our products uh, because we realize the importance of journalism. We send a lot of traffic to news publishers. All the ad technology questions I'm getting asked today, we invest in ad technology, share a majority of revenue back to publishers. Uh, we are investing in subscription products. We have committed to billion dollars in new licensing over the next three years to news organizations. We have set up local uh, emergency fund through COVID uh, for local uh, journalistic institutions. Uh, I could give plenty of examples, but the underlying forces which are impact, impacting the industry, which is the internet, and whether it's Google, if not Google, advertisers are well, finding all so sources. Think, yeah, um, I, don't, I don't have a clock on, so I don't know how much yeah, time well, I have to leave, up, Mr. You're Pukai. a minute and a half over, but so let's see. Okay, well, I'll just leave it with this, that, that Mr. Pukai, you hit on the key word, majority. I don't think that you return the majority of the revenue to these broadcast entities. I do think it's a problem. Yes, they've had to make it through the transformation, which is a rocky transformation, but we need, the message from today's hearing is the free press needs to live and be supported by all of us. And we look forward to discussing how we can make sure that they get fair return on their value. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Cantwell. We will now take a five minute recess um, and, uh, and, and uh, then we'll begin. We, most of our members have not yet had a chance to ask questions. Uh, the com committee is in recess for five minutes.
Okay, this hearing will return to order, and we understand that Senator Moran is next. So, sir, you are recognized. Chairman Wicker, uh, thank you very much, uh, and thank you for you and Senator Cantwell hosting this hearing. Uh, let me address uh, initially the, the, the topic that seems to be primary today, and then, if time, data privacy. Uh, let me ask all three witnesses, how much money does your company spend annually on content moderation? How many people work uh, in general in the area of content moderation, including uh, by private contract? Uh, let me just start with those two questions. Ultimately, I also want to ask you, how much money does your company spend in defending lawsuits stemming from user content on the platform? Okay, uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, you want to go first there? Senator, we have more than 35,000 people who work on content uh, and, and safety review, and I, I believe our budget is um, uh, uh, multiple billions of dollars a year um, on this. I think upwards of, of three um, or, or maybe even more billion dollars a year, which um, you know, is a greater uh, amount in, in revenue uh, in, in that, that we're spending on this than the whole revenue of our company was um, the year before we filed to go public in, in 2012. Mr. Thank you. Um, Senator, uh, we, we use both a combination of uh, human reviewers and uh, AI moderation systems. Uh, we, we have uh, well over uh, 10,000 reviewers and we are investing there uh, significantly and uh, you know I would I would again I'm not sure of the exact numbers but I would I would say it's in the order of over a billion dollars uh, we spend on these things. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Dorsey. I, I don't have the specific numbers, but we want to maintain um, agility between um, the, the people that we have working on this and also just building better technology to to automate it. So our our goal is flexibility here. Let me ask the question again about how much uh, would you estimate that your company is currently spending on defending lawsuits uh, related to user content? In the same order, okay? Senator, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head, but I can I can get back to you. Thank you. Uh, Senator, we do, we do spend a lot on uh, legal lawsuits, uh, but not sure what of it applies to uh, content related issues, but happy to follow. Thank you. And I, I don't have those those numbers. Let me use your answers to highlight something that I want to be a, a topic of our conversation as we debate this legislation. Whatever the numbers are, you indicate that they are significant. Uh, it's an a, a enormous amount of money and an enormous amount of employee time. Uh, contract labor time in dealing with the modification of content. These, co these, these efforts are expensive, and I would highlight for uh, my colleagues on the committee that they will not be any uh, less uh, expensive, perhaps less in scale, but not less in cost for startups and small businesses. And uh, as we develop our policies in regard to this topic, I want to make certain that entrepreneurship, startup businesses, uh, and uh, small business are considered in what it would cost in their efforts to meet the kind of standards that um, to, to, to operate in this sphere. Let me quickly turn to federal privacy. I chair the Consumer Data Privacy Security Act. We've tried for months, Senator Blumenthal and I, uh, to develop a, a, a bipartisan piece of legislation. We became, we were close, but unsuccessful in doing so. Let me ask um, Mr. Zuckerberg, Facebook entered into a consent order with the FTC in July of 2012 for violations of the FTC Act, and later agreed to pay a $5 billion penalty along with a robust settlement order in 2018 following the Cambria Analytica incident that violated the 2012 order. Uh, my legislation will provide the FTC with first-time civil penalty authority. Do you think this type of enforcement tool for the FTC would better deter unfair and deceptive practices than the current enforcement regime? Uh, Senator, I, I would need to understand it in a little bit more detail before, um, before weighing in on this. 
Um, but I think that the, the settlement that we have with the FTC, um, we're going to be setting up an, an industry-leading privacy program. We have, I think, more than a thousand engineers working on the privacy program uh, now, and it, um, you know, we're basically implementing a, a, a program which is sort of the equivalent of Sarbanes-Oxley's uh, financial uh, regulation uh, around kind of internal auditing and controls around privacy and protecting people's data as well. So I think that that uh, settlement will be. Uh, quite effective in, in, um, in ensuring that people's uh, data and, and privacy are protected. Mr. Pichai, uh, Google YouTube's $170 million settlement with the FTC in the state of New York, New York for uh, alleged violations of uh, COPPA um, in, involved persistent identifiers. How should federal legislation address persistent identifiers for consumers over the age of 13? Uh, Senator, uh, we today have invested, we've done two things as a company. We have invested in one of a kind special product called YouTube Kids, where content can be safe for kids. Obviously, on the YouTube main product, uh, today, the way internet gets used, uh, families to view content, and part of our settlement was uh, adapting so that we can accommodate for those use cases as well. Uh, you know, privacy is one of the most important areas we invest in as a company have thousands of engineers working on it. We believe in giving users control choice and transparency. And anytime we associate data with users, we are transparent. They can go see what data is there. We give them uh, uh, delete controls. We give data portability options. And just last year, we announced an important change by which for all new users, we delete the data automatically uh, without them needing to do anything. And we encourage users to go through privacy checkup. Over a billion people have gone through their privacy checkups, and uh, you know it's a it's an area where we are investing significantly. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I don't see my time clock. Do I have time for one uh, more? You you really don't. We your All time right. has just expired. But thank you very much for um, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Senator Markey. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, today, Trump his Republican allies in Congress and his propaganda parrots on Fox News are peddling a myth. And today, my Republican colleagues uh, on the Senate Commerce Committee are simply doing the president's bidding. Let's be clear. Republicans can and should join us in addressing the real problems posed by big tech. But instead, my Republican colleagues are determined to feed a false narrative about anti-conservative bias meant to intimidate big tech so it will stand idly by and allow interference in our election again. Here's the truth. Violence and hate speech online are real problems. Anti-conservative bias is a problem. Our foreign attempts to influence our election with disinformation are real problems. Anti-conservative bias is not a problem. The big tech business model, which puts profits ahead of people, is a real problem. Anti-conservative bias is not a problem. The issue is not that the companies before us today are taking too many posts down. The issue is that they're leaving too many dangerous posts up. In fact, they're amplifying harmful content so that it spreads like wildfire and torches our democracy. Mr. Zuckerberg, when President Trump posted on Facebook that when the looting starts, the shooting starts, you fail to take down that post. Within a day, the post had hundreds of thousands of shares and likes on Facebook. Since then, the president has gone on national television and told a hate group to, quote, stand by. And he has repeatedly refused to commit that he will accept the election results. Mr. Zuckerberg, can you commit that if the president goes on Facebook and encourages violence after election results are announced, that you will make sure your company's algorithms don't spread that content and you will immediately remove those messages? 
Senator, yes. Uh, incitement of violence is against our policy, and there are not exceptions to that, including for politicians. There are exceptions, did you say? There are not exceptions. There are no exceptions, which is very important because obviously um, there could be a message that messages that are sent uh, that could throw our democracy into chaos. Uh, and uh, a lot of it can be and will be created uh, if social media uh, sites do not police what the president says. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, if President Trump shares Russian or Iranian disinformation, uh, lying about the outcome of the election, can you commit that you will make sure your algorithms do not amplify that content and that you will immediately take that content down? Senator, we have a policy in place that prevents any candidate or campaign um, from prematurely declaring victory or uh, trying to delegitimize the result of the election. And what we will do in that case is we will append some um, factual information to any post that is trying to do that. Um, so if someone says that they won the election when the result isn't in, for example, um, we will append a piece of information to that saying that official election results are not in yet. Um, so that way, anyone who sees that post um, will see that context in line. And also, if one of the candidates uh, tries to prematurely declare victory or, or cite an incorrect result, um, we have a precaution that we've built in to put at the top of the Facebook app for everyone who signs in in the U.S. Um, information about the accurate uh, U.S. election voting results. I think that this is a very important um, issue to make sure that, that people can get accurate information about the results of the election. Yeah, it, it cannot be uh, stated as being uh, anything less than critically important. Democracy could be seriously challenged beginning next Tuesday evening and for several days afterwards, maybe longer, and a lot of responsibility is going to be on the shoulders of Facebook and our other witnesses today. Mr. Zuckerberg, if President Trump uses his Facebook account to call for armed private citizens to patrol the polls on Election Day, which would constitute illegal, Ill illegal voter intimidation in violation of the Voting Rights Act, will you commit that your algorithms will not spread that content and that you will immediately take that content down? Senator, my understanding is that content like what you're saying would violate our voter suppression policies and, um, and and would come down. Okay, again, the stakes are going to be very high, and we're going to take that as a commitment uh, that, uh, that you will do that, because obviously uh, we would otherwise have a serious uh, question mark placed over our elections. Um, we know Facebook cares about one thing, using keeping users glued to its platform. One of the ways you do that is with Facebook groups. Mr. Zuckerberg, in 2017, you announced the goal of 1 billion users joining Facebook groups. Unfortunately, these forum pages have become breeding grounds for hate, echo chambers of misinformation, and venues for coordination of violence. Again, Facebook is not only failing to take these pages down, it is actively spreading these pages and helping these groups' recruitment efforts. Facebook's own internal research found that 64% of all extremist group joins are due to Facebook's recommendation tools. Mr. Zuckerberg, will you commit to stopping all group recommendations on your platform until U.S. election results are certified, yes or no? Uh, Senator, we have step of stopping recommendations and groups for um, for all political content or, or social issue groups as, as a precaution for this. Um, but just to clarify one thing, the, the vast, vast majority of groups and communities that people are a part of um, are, are, are not extremist organizations or even political. They're, they're interest-based and, and communities that uh, I think are, are quite um, helpful and, and healthy for, for people to be a part of. Um, I do think we need to make sure that our, our recommendation uh, algorithm doesn't encourage people to join uh, extremist groups. That's something that we uh, have already taken a number of steps on, and I agree with you, is very important that we continue to make progress on. Well, your algorithms are promoting 
online spaces that foster political violence, at the very least, you should disable those algorithms that are recruiting users during this most sensitive period of our democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Markey. Let me, Mr. Zuckerberg, let me just ask you this. Uh, in these scenarios that Senator Markey uh, <clears throat> was uh, posing, that uh, the action of Facebook would not be a function of algorithms in those cases, would it? Senator, I, I think that that's a, that you're right and that that's a good clarification. A lot of this is more about uh, enforcement of content policies. Um, some of the questions were about algorithms. I think group ranking is is an algorithm, but um, but broadly, I think a lot of it is content enforcement. Thank you for, for clarifying that. Senator Blackburn, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank each of you for coming to to us voluntarily. We appreciate that. There are undoubtedly benefits to using your platforms. As you have heard everyone mention today, there are also some concerns, which you're also hearing. Privacy, free speech, politics, uh, religion. And uh, I have kind of chuckled as I've sat here listening to you all, that book, Valley of the Gods. It reminds me that you all are kind of in control of what people are going to hear, what they're going to see, uh, and therefore you have the ability to dictate uh, what is coming in, what information is coming into them. And I think it's important to realize, you know, you're set up as an information source, not as a news media. And so therefore censoring things that you all think unseemly may be something that, that is not unseemly to people in other parts of the country. But let me ask each of you very quickly, do any of you have any content moderators who are conservatives? Mr. Dorsey first, yes or no? But we don't ask political ideology. Okay, you happened. don't. Okay, Mr. Zuckerberg. Uh, Senator, we don't ask for their ideology, but just statistically, okay. there are 35,000 of them in cities and places all across the, okay. the country and That's world. Great. So I would imagine yes. Mr. Patai? Uh, the answer would be yes, because we hired them, uh, to, you know, through the United States. Okay. All right. And uh, looking at some of your censoring, uh, Mr. Dorsey, you all have censored Joe Biden zero times. You have censored Donald Trump 65 times. So I want to go back to con uh, Senator Gardner's questions. You claimed earlier that the Holocaust denial and threats of Jewish gen genocide by Iran's terrorist Ayatollah don't violate Twitter's so-called rules and that it's important for world leaders like Iran's terrorist leader to have a platform on Twitter. So let me ask you this, who elected the Ayatollah? Um, I don't know. You don't know? Okay. Uh, I think this is called a dictatorship. So are people in Iran allowed to use Twitter or does the country whose leader you claim deserves a platform ban them from doing so? Uh, ideally, we would love for the people of Iran to, to use Twitter. Yeah. Um, well, Ron bans Twitter and Mr. Zuckerberg, I know you are aware they ban Facebook also. So, Mr. Dorsey, is Donald Trump a world leader? Yes. Okay. So, it would be important for world leaders to have access to your platform, correct? Correct. And so, why do you deny that platform via censorship to the U.S. president? We haven't censored the U.S. president. Oh, yes, you have. How many posts from Iran's terrorist Ayatollah have you censored? Um, How many posts from Vladimir Putin have you censored? We have, we have labeled tweets of world leaders. Uh, we have okay. a policy okay. around not taking down the content, but simply adding more president. context around it. Okay. And the U.S. president you have censored 65 times. You testified that you're worried about disinformation and election interference. That is something we all worry about. And of course, for about a hundred years, foreign sources have been trying to influence U.S. policy in U.S. elections. 
Now they're onto your platforms. They see this as a way to get access to the American people. So given your refusal to censor or ban foreign dictators while regularly censoring the president, aren't you at this very moment personally responsible for flooding the nation with foreign disinformation? Just to be clear, we, we have not censored the president. We have not um, taken the tweets down that you're referencing. Um, they have more context and a label uh, applied to them. And we do the same for leaders around the world. Okay. Uh, let me ask you this. Do you share any of your data mining? And this is to each of the three of you. Do you share any of your data mining with the Democrat National Committee? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by the question, but uh, we have a we have a data platform that we have a number of customers. Um, I'm not sure um, of the customer list. Okay, and you said you don't keep list. I made that note. Uh, well, keep, keep a list of places. accounts that we yeah. watch. We okay. don't keep a list of accounts that we watch. All right. Okay, Mr. Pichai, is Blake Lemoyne, one of your engineers, still working with you? Um, Senator, I'm familiar with this name uh, as an as an employee. I'm not sure okay. whether he's currently an employee. Okay. Uh, uh, well, he has had very unkind things to say about me, and uh, I was just wondering if you all had still uh, kept him working there. Also, I want to mention with you, Mr. Pakai, uh, the way you all have censored uh, some things. Google searches for Joe Biden generated approximately 30,000 impressions um, for Breitbart links. This was on May 1, and after May 5th, both the impressions and the cl clicks went to zero. I hope that what you all realize from this hearing is that there is a pattern. You may not believe it exists, but there is a pattern of subjective manipulation of the information that is available to people from your platforms. What has driven additional attention to this is the fact that more of a family's functional life is now being conducted online. Because of this, more people are realizing that you are picking winners and losers. You're trying to, Mr. Zuckerberg, years ago you said Facebook functioned more like a government than a company. And you're beginning to, to insert yourself into these issues of free speech. Um, Mr. Zuckerberg, with my time that is left, um, let me ask you this. Uh, you mentioned early in your remarks that uh, you saw some things as competing equities. Is the First Amendment a given right or is that a competing equity? Uh, I, I believe strongly in free expression. Um, sorry if I was on mute there. Um, but I do think that like all equities, um, it needs to, it, it is balanced against other equities like safety and privacy. And even the people who believe in the strongest possible interpretation of the First Amendment um, still believe that there should be some limits on speech when it could cause imminent risk of physical harm. The, the kind of famous example that's used is that you can't shout fire in a crowded theater. Uh, so I think that getting those equities in the balance right, right. is the challenge expired. that we face. The, the time has, has expired. Perhaps we can follow. Well, we up. believe in the First Amendment, and we are going to. Yes, we will have questions to follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank I can't you, see the clock. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Senator Udall. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, thank you, and Senator Cantwell, really appreciate this hearing. I uh, want to start by laying out three facts. The U.S. intelligence community has found that the Russian government is intent on election interference in the United States. They did it in 2016. They're doing it in 2020. The intelligence also says they want to help President Trump. They did so in 2016. President doesn't, president doesn't like this to be said, but it's a fact. 
We also know that the Russian strategy this time around is going after Hunter Biden. So I recognize that the details of how to handle misinformation on the internet are tough. But I think the companies like Twitter and Facebook that took action to not be a part of a suspected Russian election interference operation were doing the right thing. And let me be clear, no one believes these companies represent the law or represent the public. When we say work the refs, the US government is the referee, the FCC, the Congress, the presidency, and the Supreme Court are the referees. It's very dangerous for President Trump, Justice Thomas, and Republicans in Congress and at the FCC to threaten new federal laws in order to force social media companies to amplify false claims to conspiracy theories and disinformation campaigns. And my question to all three of you, do the, Ru does, do the Russian government and other foreign nations continue to attempt to use your company's platforms to spread disinformation and influence the 2020 election? Can you briefly describe what you are seeing? Please start Mr. Dorsey and then Mr. Pichai and Mr. Zuckerberg, you gave an answer partially on this. I'd like you to expand on that answer. Thank you. Yes, so we, we do continue to see um, interference. Um, we recently disclosed actions we took on both uh, Russia and um, actions originating out of Iran. Um, we've made those disclosures public. Um, we can you know, share those with, with your team. Um, but this remains, as you've heard from others uh, in, on the panel, and as Mark has detailed, um, one of our highest priorities uh, and something we want to make sure that we are focused on uh, eliminating as much uh, platform manipulation as possible. Senator, um, we, we do continue to see uh, coordinated influence operation attempts. Uh, we've been very vigilant. Uh, we appreciate the cooperation we get from intelligence agencies and as companies, we are sharing information to give you an example and, and we publish uh, transparency reports. In June, we identified uh, efforts, uh, one from uh, Iran, uh, Group APD 35, targeting the Trump campaign, one from China, a Group APD 31, targeting the Biden campaign. Uh, most of this were phishing attempts. Uh, our spam filters were able to remove uh, most of the emails out from reaching users, but we notified intelligence agencies. And that's an example of the kind of activity we see. And, you know, I think it's an area where we would need strong cooperation with government uh, agencies moving forward. Mr. Zucker. Senator, uh, like Jack and, and Sundar, um, you know, we also see uh, continued attempts by, by Russia and, and other countries, um, especially Iran and China, um, to run these kind of information operations. Uh, we also see an increase in, in, in kind of domestic operations around the world. Uh, fortunately, we've been able to build partnerships across the industry, uh, both with the companies here today and with law enforcement and the intelligence community, um, to be able to share signals to uh, identify these threats sooner. And you know, along the lines of what you mentioned earlier, um, you know, one of the threats that the FBI uh, has alerted our companies and the public to was the possibility of a hack and leak operation in the days or weeks leading up to this election. Uh, so you had both the public testimony from, from the FBI um, and in, in private meetings, um, alerts that, that were given to uh, at least our company, I assume the others as well, that suggested that we be on high alert and sensitivity that if uh, a trove of documents appeared, uh, that, that we should view that with suspicion um, that it might be part of a foreign uh, manipulation attempt. Uh, so that's what we're seeing, and I'm happy to go into more detail as well if that's helpful. Okay, thank you very much. And I, this one's a really simple question, I think a yes or no. Will you continue to push back against this kind of foreign interference, even if powerful Republicans threaten to take official action against your companies? Mr. Zuckerberg, why don't we start with you and work the other way back? 
Senator, absolutely. This is incredibly important for our democracy, and we're committed to doing this work. Senator, uh, absolutely. Uh, protecting our civic and democratic process is fundamental to what we do, and we will do everything we can. Yes, and we will continue to work and, and push back on any uh, manipulation of the, of the platform. Thank you for those answers. Mr. Zuckerberg, do Facebook and other social media networks have an obligation to prevent disinformation and malicious actors spreading conspiracy theories? dangerous health disinformation and hate speech, even if preventing its spread means less traffic and potentially less advertising revenue for Facebook. Senator, in general, yes. I think that for foreign countries trying to interfere in democracy, I think that that is a relatively clear cut question where I would hope that uh, no one disagrees that we, we don't want uh, foreign countries or governments trying to interfere in our elections, whether through disinformation or fake accounts um, or, or anything like that. Um, around uh, health misinformation, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. It's a, it's a health emergency. Um, I, I certainly think that this is a high sensitivity time. Uh, so we're treating with extra sensitivity any misinformation that could lead to harm around COVID. Um, that would lead people to not get the, the right treatments or to not take the right security precautions. Uh, we do draw a distinction between harmful misinformation and uh, information that's just wrong, um, and we take a harder line and, and more enforcement against harmful misinformation. Thank you. Thank Senator, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Udall. Senator Capito. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you for being uh, with us today. I would say that any time that we get, we can get the three of you in front of the American people, uh, whether it's several days before an election or several days af after, is extremely useful and, and can be very productive. So I appreciate uh, the three of you coming and the committee holding this hearing. As we've heard, Americans turn every day to your platforms for a lot of different information. I would like to give a shout out to uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, because the last time he was in front of our committee, I had asked him to uh, share the, the, the plenty of Facebook uh, into rural America and, and, and help us with our fiber deployments into rural America. And when we see in this COVID environment, we see how important that is. And he followed through with that. I would like to thank him and his company for helping partner with us in West Virginia to get more people connected. And I think that is an essential, I would make a suggestion as well, maybe when we get to the end, when we talk about fines, what I think we could do with these millions and billion dollar fines that some of your companies have have um, been uh, penalized on, we could make it. We could make a great jump and get to that last household. Uh, but the topic today is uh, on objectionable content and how you make those judgments. So quickly, each one of you, I know that in the section 230, it says that uh, it's the term is objectionable content or otherwise objectionable. Would you be um, in favor of redefining that more specifically. That's awful broad, and that's where I think some of these questions become very difficult to answer. So we'll start with uh, Mr. Mr. Dorsey on the uh, how do you define otherwise objectionable and objectionable, and how can we improve that de definition so that it's easier to follow? Well, our, our interpretation of, of objectionable is anything that is limiting potentially the speech of others. A lot of our policies are focused on making sure that people feel safe to express themselves. Um, and when we see abuse, harassment, misleading information, these are all threats against that. And it makes people want to leave um, the internet, makes, makes people want to leave um, these conversations online. So that is what we're trying to protect, is making sure that people feel safe enough and free enough to express themselves in whatever way they wish. So this is a follow up to that. Uh, much has been talked about the uh, uh, blocking of the New York Post. Do you have an instance or for instance of when you've actually blocked somebody that would be considered politically liberal on the other side in the political realm and in this country? Do you have an example of that to sort of offset where where the New York Post uh, criticism has come from? Well, we, we don't have an understanding of the ideology of uh, any one particular account, and, and that is also not how our policies are written or enforcement taken. So I'm sure there are a number of examples, um, but uh, that, that, is not, that is not our focus. We're looking 
purely at the violations of our policies, taking action against that. Yeah, Mr. Zuckerberg, how would you define otherwise objectionable, objectionable, not how would you define it, but how would you refine the de definition of that to make it uh, more, um, more objective than subjective? Senator, thank you. When I look at the written language in Section 230 and the content that we think uh, shouldn't be allowed on our services, um, some of the things that we bucket in otherwise objectionable content today include general bullying and harassment of, of people on the platform. Um, so somewhat similar to what Jack was just talking about a, a, a minute ago. Um, and I would worry that some of the proposals uh, that suggest getting rid of the phrase otherwise objectionable from Section 230 um, would limit our ability to uh, remove bullying and harassing content from our platforms, which I think would make them uh, worse places for, for, for people. So I, I think we need to be very careful in how we think through that. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Pichai? Senator, uh, maybe where I would add is that uh, the, the content is so dynamic. YouTube gets 500 hours per minute of video uploaded uh, on an average of any day search, 15% of queries we have never seen before. To give you an example, a few years ago, there was an issue around teenagers consuming Tide Pods, and it, it was a kind of issue which was causing real harm. When we run into those situations, we are able to act with certainty and protect our users. The Christchurch shooting, where there was a live shooter, uh, you know, live streaming horrific images, it was a learning moment for all our platforms. We were able to intervene, uh, again, with certainty. And so that's what otherwise objectionable allows. And, you know, I think, uh, I think that flexibility is what allows us to focus. We always state with clear policies what we are doing, uh, but I think it gives platforms of all sizes, uh, you know, flexibilities uh, to protect our users. Thank you. I think, uh, you know, I'm hearing from both, all three of you really that the definition, uh, you know, is fairly acceptable to you all. In my view, sometimes I, I think it can go too much to the eye of the beholder type of, of uh, and the beholder being either a you all or your reviewers or your AI, and then it, it, it gets into a region where uh, maybe it becomes so, so very subjective. I want to move to a different topic because in my personal conversations with at least two of you, um, you've uh, expressed the, the need to have the 230 protections because of the protections that it gives to the small innovators. Well, you sit in front of us and I think all of us are wondering who, how many small innovators and what kind of market share could they possibly have when we see the dominance of, of the three of you. So how, uh, I understand you started as small innovators when you first started, I get that. Um, how can a small innovator really break through? And, and what does 230 really have to do with the ability of a, I'm, I'm skeptical on the argument, quite frankly. So whoever wants to answer that, um, Mr. Zuckerberg, you want to start? Sure, Senator. I, I do think that if, when we were getting started with uh, building Facebook, if we were subject to a larger number of content lawsuits because 230 didn't exist, that would have likely made it prohibitive for me as a college student in a dorm room to uh, get started with this enterprise. And I, I think that um, it, it may make sense to, to uh, modify 230 at this point just to make sure that it's still working as intended. But I think it's extremely important that we make sure that, um, that for smaller companies that are getting started, um, the cost of, of having to comply with any regulation um, is either waived until a certain scale or is, is at a minimum uh, taken into account as a serious factor to make sure that we're not preventing the next set of ideas from getting built. Thank you. Thank right. you, Senator. Thank Baldwin. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Baldwin. Uh, thank you. I'd like to begin by making two points. Uh, I believe the Republicans have called this hearing in order to support a false narrative fabricated by the president to help his reelection prospects. And number two, I believe that the tech companies here today need to take more action, not less, to combat misinformation, including misinformation on the election, misinformation on the COVID-19 pandemic, and misinformation and uh, posts uh, meant to incite violence. Um, and that should include 
misinformation spread by President Trump on their platforms. So I want to start with asking the committee clerk to uh, bring up my first slide. Um, Mr. Dorsey, I appreciate the work that Twitter has done to flag or even take down false or misleading information about COVID-19, such as this October 11th tweet by the president claiming he has immunity from the virus after contracting it and recovering, contrary to what the medical community tells us. Just yesterday morning, the president tweeted this, that the media is incorrectly focused on the pandemic and that our nation is, quote, rounding the turn on COVID-19. In fact, according to Johns Hopkins University in the past week, the seven day national average of new cases reached its highest level ever. And in my home state of Wisconsin, case counts continue to reach record levels. Yesterday, Wisconsin set a new record with 64 deaths and 5,462 new confirmed cases of COVID-19. That is not rounding the turn but it's also not a tweet that was flagged or taken down. Mr. Dorsey, given the volume of misleading posts about COVID-19 out there, do you prioritize removal based on something like the reach or audience of a particular user of twi Twitter? I, I, I could be mistaken, but it looks like the tweet that you showed um, actually did have a label uh, pointing to both of them, uh, pointing to our COVID uh, resource uh, hub in our interface. Um, so we, with, in regards to misleading information, we have policies against uh, manipulated media uh, for uh, in support of public health and and, and COVID information, um, and uh, and we and election interference and um, civic integrity, and we take action on it. In some cases, it's labeling. Uh, in some cases, it's uh, removal. What additional steps are you planning to take to address dangerously misleading tweets like the president's rounding the turn tweet? Uh, we we want to make sure that we are giving people as much information as, as possible um, and that ultimately we're connecting the dots when they see information like that, um, that they have an easy way to get, uh, uh, you know, an official resource or um, uh, many more viewpoints on what they're, what they're seeing. So um, we'll continue to refine our policy. We'll continue to refine our enforcement around misleading information. And we're looking deeply at how we can uh, evolve our product to do the same. Um, Mr. Zuckerberg, I want to turn to you to talk about the ongoing issue of right-wing militias using Facebook as a platform to organize and promote violence. Uh, could the co committee clerk please bring up my second slide? Um, on August 25th, a self-described militia group called Kenosha Guard created a Facebook event page entitled Armed Citizens to Protect Our Lives and Property, encouraged, uh, encouraging armed individuals to go to Kenosha and quote, defend the city during a period of civil unrest following the police shooting of Jacob Blake. That evening, a 17-year-old from Illinois did just that and ended up killing two protesters and seriously injuring a third. Commenters in this group wrote that they wanted to kill looters and rioters and switch to real bullets and put a stop to these rioting, impetuous children. While Facebook has already had a policy in, in place banning militia groups, this play, page remained in place. According to press reports, Facebook received more than 450 complaints about this page, but your content moderators did not remove it, something you subsequently called an operational mistake. Recently, uh, as you heard earlier in questions, the alleged plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer um, and the potential for intimidation or even violence at voting locations 
show that the proliferation of the threat of violence on Facebook remains a very real and urgent problem. Mr. Zuckerberg, in light of the operational mistake around Kenosha, what steps has Facebook taken to ensure that your platform is not being used to promote more of this type of violence? Thank you, Senator. Uh, this is, is uh, a, a big area of concern for me personally and for the company. Um, we've strengthened our policies uh, to prohibit any militarized social movement. So any kind of militia like this, um, we, we've also banned um, conspiracy networks. So QAnon being the largest example of that, that is, is completely prohibited on Facebook at this point, um, which, you know, in this period where, where I'm, I'm personally I'm worried about the potential of, of, of increased civil unrest, um, making sure that those groups can't organize on Facebook may cut off, may, may cut off some legitimate uses, uh, but I think that they will also preclude um, greater potential for organizing any harm. And by making the policy simpler, we will also make it so that uh, there are fewer mistakes in content moderation. Uh, so I, I feel like we're, we're, in a, we're in a much stronger place on, on the policies on this at this point. Thank you, Senator Baldwin. Uh, Senator Lee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to read a few quotes uh, from, from each of you, each of our three witnesses, and from your companies. Um, and then I may ask for a response. So, Mr. Zuckerberg, this one's from you. Uh, you said, quote, we've built Facebook to be a platform for all ideas. Our community's success depends on everyone feeling comfortable sharing what they want. It doesn't make sense for our mission or for our business to suppress political content or prevent anyone from seeing what matters most to them. Uh, you said that, I believe, on May 18th, 2016. Mr. Dorsey, uh, on September 5th, 2018, you said, let me cl be clear about one important and foundational fact. Twitter does not use political ideology to make any decisions. Mr. Pakai, on October 28th, uh, 2020, you said, let me be clear. We approach our work without political bias, full stop. Now, these quotes make me think that there is a good case to be made that you're, you're engaging in unfair or deceptive trade practices in violation of federal law. I see these quotes where each of you uh, uh, tell consumers and the public uh, about your business practices. But then you seem to do the opposite and take censorship-related actions against the president, against members of his administration, against the New York Post, the Babylon Bee, the Federalist, pro-life groups, and there are countless other examples. In fact, I, I think the trend is clear that you, you almost always censor, meaning, uh, and when I use the word censor here, I, 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 meaning, uh, I, I mean block content, fact check, uh, or label content, or uh, demonetize websites of conservative, Republican, or pro-life individuals, or groups, or companies, contradicting your commercial promises. But I don't see this suppression of high-profile liberal commentators. So, for example, have you, have you ever censored a Democratic senator? How about President Obama? How about a Democratic presidential candidate? How about Planned Parenthood or NARAL or EMILY's List? So, uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, Mr. Dorsey, and, and Mr. Pekai, can, can any of you, and, and let's go in that order, uh, Zuckerberg, Dorsey, and then Pekai, can you name for me one high-profile person or entity from a liberal ideology who you have censored and, and what particular action you took? Uh, Senator, I can get you a, a, a list of some more of this, but there are certainly many examples that your, your Democratic colleagues um, object to when, when um, you know, a fact checker might label something as false that they disagree with or um, they're yeah, not able yeah, to, I, to. I get that. I, I get that. I just want to be clear. I, I'm just asking you if you can name for me uh, uh, one high profile liberal person or company who you've censored. I understand that the, the, uh, it, you're saying that there are complaints on both sides, but I just, I just want one name of one person or one entity. 
Um, so, Senator, I need to I need to think about it and and and, and get you more of a list. But but there are certainly many many issues on both sides of the aisle where people think we are we are making content moderation decisions that they disagree with. I, I got that, and I think everybody on this call could uh, agree that they could identify at least um, uh, five, maybe ten, maybe more high-profile conservative exam uh, examples. Uh, what about you, Mr. Dorsey? Well, we, we can um, give a more exhaustive list, um, but again, we don't have an understanding of political ideology yeah, not, of our accounts. But I'm not asking for an exhaustive list. I'm asking for a single example, one, just one individual, one entity, anyone. We, we've, we've taken action on tweets from members of the House for election misinfo. Can you identify any example? Yes, we had two, two Democratic, um, two, two Democratic uh, Congress people on election what are their misinfo. Names? I'll, I'll get those, those names too. Great, great. Mr. Pekai, how about you? Um, Senator, I'll give specific examples, but uh, let me step back. We don't censor. We have uh, moderation policies, which we apply uh, equally. To give you an example, yeah, on our ads. I, I get that. I, I use the word censor as a term of art there, and I define that term. I, and, and I don't, well, again, I'm not asking for a comprehensive list. I, I want a name. We have, we have, we have uh, you know, turned down ads from Priorities USA, from Vice President Biden's campaign. We have had uh, compliance issues with World Socialist uh, Review, which is a, a left-leaning publication. Well, I, we can give you several examples. But for example, when we have a graphic content policy, we don't allow for ads which show graphic violent content in those ads. And we have taken down ads on both sides of the campaign, and I gave you a couple of examples. OK. Um, at least with respect uh, to uh, Mr. Zuckerberg and Mr. Dorsey, and, and, and I would point out that with respect to Mr. Uh, Pakai, uh, those are not nearly as high profile. I don't know if I can identify anyone uh, picked at random from the public, even picked at random from the public as far as members of the political active community and either political party who could identify those right off the top of the bat. It, it, look, there, there is a disparity uh, between the censorship and, and again, I'm using that as a term of art, as I've defined it a moment ago, between the censorship of conservative and liberal points of view. And it's an enormous disparity. Now, you have the right. I want to be very clear about this. You have every single right to set your own terms of service and to interpret them and to make decisions about violations. But given the disparate impact of who gets censored on your platforms, it seems that you're either one, not enforcing your, 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 your terms of service equally, or alternatively, two, that you're writing your standards to target conservative viewpoints. You certainly have the right to operate your own platform, but you also have to be transparent about your actions, it, it, at least in the sense that uh, uh, you, you can't promise certain corporate behavior and then deceive customers through contradictory actions. It, that just blatantly contradict what you've stated as your corporate business model or as your policy. So, Mr. Mr. Zuckerberg and Mr. Dorsey, if if Facebook if Facebook is still a platform for all ideas, and if Twitter quote does not use political ideology to make decisions, then do you state before this committee that, for the record, that you always apply your terms of service equally to all of your users? Senator, our principle is to stand for free expression and to be a platform for all ideas. Um, I, I certainly don't think we have any um, intentional examples where we're trying to um, enforce our policies in a way that is anything other than fair and consistent. But it's, it's also a big company, so I, I, I get that there are probably mistakes that are made from time to time. But our North Star and, and what we intend to do um, is to be a platform for all ideas and to give everyone a voice. Okay, I, I appreciate that. I, I understand what you're saying about intentional examples and a big company, but uh, again, there is a disparate impact. There, there is a disparate impact that's unmistakable, as evidenced by the fact that neither you nor Jack could identify a single a single example. Mr. Dorsey, how do you answer that question? A brief answer, please, Mr. Dorsey. Uh, yes, we 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 operate our our enforcement and our policy without an understanding of political ideology. We don't. Anytime we find uh, uh, examples of, of bias um, in, in how people operate our systems or our algorithms, we remove it. And um, as, as Mark mentioned, 
there are checkpoints uh, in these in these companies in the in these frameworks, and we do need more transparency around them and how they work. And we do need a much more straightforward and quick and efficient appeals process to give us a further checkpoint from the public. Thank you, Senator Lee. Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I've devoted my life to public service, to upholding a sacred oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I have to be honest, it makes my blood boil and it also breaks my heart a little as I watch my Republican colleagues just days before an election sink down to the level of Donald Trump. By placing the selfish interests of Donald Trump ahead of the health of our democracy, Senate Republicans, whether they realize it or not, are weakening our national security and providing aid to our adversaries. As my late friend Congressman Cummings often reminded us, you know, we're better than this. Look, our democracy is under attack right now. Every American, every member of Congress should be committed to defending the integrity of our elections from hostile foreign interference. Despite all the recent talk of great power competition, our adversaries know they still cannot defeat us on a conventional battlefield. Yet, meanwhile, the members of the United States military and our dedicated civil servants are working around the clock in the cyber domain to counter hostile actors such as Iran, China, and Russia. And they do this while the commander in chief cowers in fear of Russia and stubbornly refuses to take any action to criticize or warn Russia against endangering our troops. I have confidence in the United States armed forces, intelligence community, and civil servants. Their effective performance explains why our foreign adversaries have sought alternative avenues to attacking our nation. Afraid to face us in conventional military or diplomatic ways, they look for unconventional means to weaken our democracy, and they realize that social media could be the exhaust port of our democracy. Social media is so pervasive in the daily lives of Americans and traditional media outlets that it can be weaponized to manipulate the public discourse and stable, destabilize our institutions. You know, after Russia was incredibly successful in disrupting our democracy four years ago, all of our adversaries learned a chilling lesson. Social media companies cannot be trusted to put patriotism above profit. Facebook and Twitter utterly failed to hinder Russia's sweeping and systemic interference in our 2016 election which use the platforms to infiltrate our communities, spread disinformation, and turn Americans against one another. Of course, the situation has grown far worse today, as evidenced by today's partisan sham hearing. While corporations may plead ignorance prior to the 2016 election, President Trump and his Republican enablers in the Senate have no such excuse. Senate Republicans cut a deal to become the party of Trump, and now they find themselves playing a very dangerous game. By encouraging Russia's illegal hacking, by serving as the spreaders and promoters of disinformation cooked up by foreign intelligence services, and by falsely claiming censorship when responsible actors attempt to prevent hostile foreign adversaries from interfering in our elections, Senate Republicans insult the efforts of true patriots working to counter malign interference and weaken our security. This committee is playing politics at a time when responsible public officials should be doing everything to preserve confidence in our system of elections and system of government. The reckless actions of Donald Trump Republicans do not let technology companies off the hook. None of the companies testifying before our committee today are helpless in the face of threats to our democracy, small d democracy. Federal law provides you respective companies Federal law provides your respective companies with authority to counter foreign disinformation and counterintelligence propaganda. And I want to be absolutely clear, gentlemen, that I fully expect each of you to do so. Each of you will be attacked by the president, Senate Republicans, and right-wing media for countering hostile foreign interference in our election. But you have the duty, a duty to do the right thing because facts still exist. Facts still matter. Facts save lives. And there's no both sides when one side has chosen to reject truth and embrace poisonous false information. So in closing, I would like to each witness to provide a personal commitment that your respective companies will proactively counter domestic disinformation that spreads the dangerous lies such as masks don't work while aggressively identifying and removing disinformation that is part of foreign adversaries efforts 
to interfere in our election or undermine our democracy. Do I have that commitment from each of you gentlemen? Okay, we'll, t we'll take Dorsey, Pakai, and then Zuckerberg. Mr. Dorsey. We have made that commitment. Mr. Pakai. Uh, Senator, absolutely, yes. And Mr. Zuckerberg. Yes, Senator, I, I agree with that. Thank you. Your industry success or failure in achieving this goal will have far reaching life or death consequences for the American people and the future of our democracy. Thank you, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The Senator yields back. Senator Johnson. I'd like to start, I'd like to start with a question for all three of the uh, witnesses. Uh, you know, you have public reports that you have uh, different chat forums in, in, in all of your in companies and also public reports where, you know, the few conservatives that uh, might work for your companies have, have uh, certainly been harassed on those on those types of forums. Uh, I don't expect you to have taken poll of your employees, but I just want to get a kind of a sense because I think it's pretty obvious. But uh, would, would you say that the political ideology of the employees of your com company is, you know, let's say 50 50 conservative versus uh, uh, liberal progressive? Or do you think it's closer to 90 percent liberal, 10 percent conservative? We'll start with uh, Mr. Dorsey. Um, as you mentioned, I don't know the, the makeup of our employees because it's not something we ask or, or focus on. I mean, be, I mean, just just what, what do you think off top of your head based on your chat rooms and kind of the people you talk to? Not not something I look for. Or look yeah, right. For. Okay, Mr. Pichai. Uh, Senator, we have over 100,000 employees. For the past two years, we have hired greater than 50% of our workforce outside California. Uh, it does tend to be proportionate to the areas where we are in, uh, but uh, we do have... We have a million message boards at Google. We have groups like Republicans at, Liberals at, Conservatives at, and 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 so on. And it, we have definitely made a effort to make sure people of all viewpoints are welcome. So again, you you want to, Mrs. Zuckerberg? Will you answer the question honestly? Is it ninety ten or fifty fifty? Which is a closer to? Uh, Senator, I don't know the the exact number, but I would guess that our our employee base um, skews left leaning. Uh, as, 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 Thank you for that honesty. Uh, Mr. Mr. Dorsey, you started your opening comments that, uh, you know, you think that people don't trust you. I agree with that. We don't trust you. Um, uh, you, you all say you're, you're fair and you're consistent, uh, you're neutral, uh, you're unbiased. Mr. Dorsey, I, th I think the in most incredible answer I've seen so far in this hearing is when Senator Cruz asked, does Twitter have the ability to influence elections? Again, does Twitter have the ability to influence elections, you said no. Did you stick with that answer that you don't even believe? And let's, let's face it, you all believe that Russia has the ability to influence elections or interfere by using your social platforms. Mr. Dorsey, do you still deny that you don't have the ability to influence and interfere in our elections? Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, my answer was around uh, people's choice around other communication channels. No, your, your, your answer was, does, no, you, the question was, does Twitter have the ability to influence elections? And you said no. Do you, do you still stand by that, that, uh, that Twitter, answer? Twitter, Twitter as a company, no. no we, you, don't, you don't think you have the ability by, by moderation policies, by a Senator Lee, and I would call it censoring, you know, what you do with New York Post. You, you don't think that censorship that moderation of policies you don't think that influences elections by withholding what i believe is true information from the american public you don't think that interferes in elections not not our current moderation policies our current moderation policies are to protect the conversation and the integrity of the conversation around the elections okay for both mr zuckerberg and dorsey who who censored censored new york post stories or throttled them back do either one of you have any evidence that the New York Post story is part of Russian disinformation, or that those emails aren't authentic. Do any of you have any any information whatsoever? That they're not authentic, or that they are Russian disinformation. Mr. Dorsey, we we don't. You have no. So so why would why would you censor it? Why did you prevent that from being disseminated on your platform that is supposed to be for the free expression of ideas and particularly true ideas? We believed it fell afoul of our hacking materials policy uh we judged in the well, moment. what evidence did you have that it was hacked they, they weren't hacked we we judged in a moment that it looked like it was hacked materials you were wrong surfacing and and we updated our policy and our enforcement within 24 hours mm -hmm. um, mr zuckerman mr zuckerberg 
Uh, Senator, as I testified before, we relied heavily on the FBI's uh, intelligence and alerts to us, both through their public testimony and uh, private briefings well, and alerts did, they did, gave us. Did the FBI contact you and say the New York Post story was false? Senator, not about that story specifically. Well, it's but it's back. General. Why, why, did, why did you throttle it back? They alerted us of a to be on heightened alert around a risk of hack and leak operations around a, a release you're, you're, of information. You're and evidence. Yeah, and you're and Senator, to, to be clear on this, we didn't censor the content. We flagged it for fact checkers to review. And pending that review, uh, we temporarily constrained its distribution to make sure that it didn't uh, spread wildly while um, it was being reviewed. But uh, it's not up to us either to determine whether it's uh, Russian interference nor whether it's true. We rely on the FBI and intelligence and fact checkers to do that. Mr. Dorsey, uh, you talked about your policies toward misinformation and that you will you will block misinformation if it if it's about against civic integrity, election interference, or voter suppression. Let me give you a tweet that was put up on on uh, Twitter. It says Senator Ron Johnson is my neighbor and strangled our dog Buttons right in front of my four-year-old son and three-year-old daughter. The police refused to investigate. This is a complete lie, but important to retweet and note that there are more of my lies to come. Now, we contacted Twitter and we asked him to take it down and here's the response. Thanks for reaching out. We escalated this to our support team for their review and they have determined that this is not a violation of our policies. So, Mr. Dorsey, how could a complete lie, it's, it's, it's admitted it's a lie, how, how does that not affect civic integrity? How could you view that not as being election interference? Let's face it, that could definitely impact my bill to get reelected. How could that not be a violation of voter suppression? Obviously, if people think I'm strangling my neighbor's dog, they may not show up at the polls. That would be voter suppression. So why didn't Twitter take that? By the way, that tweet was was retweeted like something like 17,000 times and viewed by over and loved, commented, you know, appreciated by over 50,000 people. How is that not voter suppression? How is that not election interference? How does that not, that not affect the civic integrity? We'll, we'll have to look uh, into our enforcement um, or not enforcement in this case of the tweet, and we can get back to you with more context. So, Mr. M Mr. Zuckerberg, in, in that same June hearing, real quick, Mr. Dorsey, you referred to that June hearing with uh, Stefan Wolfgram had all kinds of good ideas. That's 16 months ago. Why haven't you inter Why haven't you implemented any of those transparency ideas that you thought were pretty good 16 months ago? Well, he was talking about algorithmic choice, and we have implemented one of them, which is we allow people to turn off the ranking of our timeline. Uh, the, the rest is, is work, and it's going to take some time. Well, I'd get to it if I were you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Johnson, thank you. Let me, let me just make sure I understood uh, the answer. M Mr. Um, um, Dorsey and Mr. Zuckerberg. Mr. Dorsey, did I understand you to say that you have no information indicating that the New York Post story about Hunter Biden is... Um, is a, a, has a, a Russian source. Did I understand correctly? That yes, not that I'm aware of. And, and is, is that also your answer, Mr. Zuckerberg, that you have no information at all to indicate that, that Russia was the source of this um, the New York Post article? Senator, I would rely on the FBI to make that assessment. But you, you don't have any such information, do you? I do not myself. I'm just trying to clarify the answer to Senator Johnson's question. Thank you very much for indulging me there. Senator Tester, you are next, sir. Uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank Sue, Dar, and Jack, and, and Mark for being in front of this committee. Uh, there is no doubt that there's some major issues with Google and Facebook and Twitter that Congress needs to address. Uh, quite frankly, big tech is the unregulated Wild West that needs to be held accountable.